Chris gets here, he'll start. I don't have a mic, but my voice is pretty. Uh, <laughs> can everybody hear me? I project pretty well usually. All right, so I'm Frank Barrickman with the United States Department of Transportation, National Highway Traffic Thanks. Safety Administration. Um, I'm a researcher. I do automotive research. Uh, I've been doing it now for 23 years. Um, I'm not a hacker per se. Oh, I don't have to scream now. Thanks, Bill. Sure. <laughs> um, but about uh, about 10 years ago, we started seeing some problems, and I've basically made a career out of making things do stuff they weren't supposed to do. So, you know, we needed to do research in cars, so we needed sudden acceleration to happen. Well, I was the guy that made that happen. We needed a VCR to record automatically. Probably don't, some of you don't know what a VCR is, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. We were able to go in and make that VCR happen to when the cars start to start recording. So throughout this, I've made a career of doing that. And now at this age of computers, ECUs, CAN buses, networks, V2V, uh, and all the interconnectivity, it became a real priority for our agency to make sure these things do not happen in the future. So that's just a little bit about my background, electronics uh, engineer. All right, Sasha. Hi, I'm uh, Sasha Zdelan. I'm with Exxon Mobil Corporation. Um, I'm primarily involved in uh, application security, software security, but in a broader sense, cybersecurity as well. Um, I, uh, I represent a portfolio of several thousand applications and uh, have a real passion for securing things like ERP systems. I don't think they get enough uh, attention in kind of the mainstream community. I think we spent a lot of time talking about web apps and e-commerce apps and kind of the stuff that's pretty easy and down in front, but there are a lot of things where uh, corporations store their most important information that makes the business run, things that store you know, financial information, crown jewels, things that run very proprietary optimization models. So uh, I have a big passion for securing ERP systems. And finally, Michael. So Michael McNeil, I'm in charge of the product security program at Philips, or Royal Philips now. Um, that responsibility is all of the medical devices as well as consumer items that Philips sells in terms of sonic toothbrushes and Norelco shavers and all the way up to you know MR machines and CT scanners. Um, my team has the responsibility of making sure that we have secure solutions and through our development life cycle for those products. Um, prior to that I also was the um, security officer at Medtronic. So I have had experiences with just about all of the faces that, uh, that, that Karen just showed. Um, had worked directly with, uh, with Barnaby Jack, as well as um, reporting from Jay Radcliffe um, from those product areas. Um, have dealt with Scott Irvings and you, you name it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of those experiences and alignment with with um, security researchers and kind of my philosophy and, and sort of next steps in that evolution. All right, so actually why don't we start there uh, <laughs> since, since Nickerson's not uh, maybe gonna join us today. All right. Um, what have been your experiences with researchers and particularly not just kind of a point in time snapshot, uh, but broadly throughout uh, the last few years have you been dealing with um, products and researchers? So it's, um, it, it, it's been a real, I guess, interesting ride or, or a little bit of a, of a roller coaster. I've, I've been fortunate enough that when some of the, the researchers have approached um, the, the corporations that I've been with, you typically get your you know, initial, you know, oh my God, what's, what's happening? What are you trying to do? And there's usually um, not the right point of, of interface and the connections. And so they get the runaround, which becomes a very you know, frustrating type of, of, uh, of a scenario. They also get you know, as much as they can with the legal and the, probably the communication side. They probably you know, have been given the old Heisman you know, in terms of the, the, the stiff arm and as much that that, that can be done. And so, I, I tell organizations, you know, that's the very first worst thing that you can do. Um, if you want to see a recipe for disaster, do those types of, of activities. Um, but it sometimes takes that, that crash or burn for people to really get the appropriate understanding and for you, know, you to get the movements that you, you need to put in place. So that evolution 
at least in the organizations that I've, I've been involved in and currently are at, you have to have an open door, particular um, you know, policy and positioning that has to be communicated and understood at the top of the organization. Um, I'm at a level where I get that appropriate visibility and I get that communications so that there is that better understanding. Um, as part of our evolution, they know where to come. You know, there's one spot that comes in the door. I have a team that's aligned to manage, you know, that level of communication. Any researchers that come in through that door effectively, they will get a response and a communications directly back from me. It's not pawned off. It's not, you know, um, geared to someone else. It's my job and my team's jobs to find out which sets of products or solutions that this is involved, and then for us to do the appropriate analysis jointly in validating that information you know, from the, the researcher and um, from that research community. So once we have that dialogue and, and awareness going and the organization understands that, then you can manage things a lot more effectively, and that's what we've seen to you know, at least for, for our experiences. Um, the floodgates have not, you know, opened, you know, over, you know, swamping because we have, you know, an open program. Um, it's been publicly communicated, at least when, at Phillips, when I launched it in um, November of 2014. And the reactions that we've had in terms of some of the, the research, um, worked with and, and dealt directly with our baby monitors. So you guys that know Mark Stanislav and, and Rapid7, you know, we jointly had the conversations. It was a product that Philips wasn't even manufacturing and maintaining, but it had our brand and our recognition on it. So I followed it through to make sure that it had appropriate patching and, and it was updated just as if it was still Philips with the the Gibson Innovations, which was um, care feeding for that last year. We've worked with, um, and, and the other part of my evolution is, once you start working with, with the researchers, you then also want to build in that as a part of your overall program. So majority of the people that we have worked with or that have brought, you know, at least in the medical device um, for our products, issues to us, we've been able to bring them in as a part of either my training or awareness. So a number of the researchers, when I bring my product security team and my development arms together, they also have come in and spoken to our teams and been able to enlighten them on that handshake and how to work together you know, from a cooperative perspective. So that's also been a, a, a key you know, learning um, factor. We've also leveraged them in additional either verification or other testing in terms of um, where some of their passions are as a part of our development processes. So again, I think if it's done correctly for those organizations that do want to have, have a passion, and in, in our particular case, yeah, I, this is about, you know, the very first slide or anything that I ever talk about, at least for the majority of, of, of our experience, I deal with, with patient and people's safety. And so I can't have an organization that has an ego that becomes too big that that's not the, the priority. So they have to leave that at the door, but it's my job to make sure that it's communicated, you know, effectively through our, our business, as an example. So now that uh, we've got Nick Nickerson in the room, um, he will be our moderator. I would read off his bio, but... Uh, it was hilarious. <laughs> you, you should absolutely so, read it. Yeah, you if you haven't seen it yet, it. you should go check it out. We, uh, we yeah. crowdsourced the bio on Twitter, and if you ever do that, um, I highly recommend you take everything you get from Twitter and just feed it right into the bio. It will be perfect. It was awesome. It was, yeah. yeah. Uh, that might not be hot. Um, maybe you have to turn it on. Oh, there we go. It was great. Technology. Yay, yeah, there we go. technology! Okay, so why don't you take over and carry yeah, it? Yeah, you know, so so many awesome things that you were talking about that I feel like in the wins that you guys have had separately, there's a ton of questions to be asked, not necessarily as much about what the win was, but how you won it. 
And to me, that's what I think some of the fascinating things are. And I, I feel like a lot of that is really driven by what you get passionate about. I, I, I think that very rarely in any of our careers do we pursue something without passion and ever make huge exponential pieces of success. Um, so one of the things I'd love to explore with you guys is really what are those passionate moments? What are some of the things where you actually had the switch turn on and you said, this is not only what I'm going to do or why I'm going to do, this is how it turns me on. It, this is how it, it fulfills something for myself and my role and for the company and those things join together. Because I, I, I feel like there's a huge gap often where people just go and do work. Um, but you guys are doing work that is very, very, very different. And you're accomplishing things that are extremely hard or even to the point where people say, I, I don't think it could be done in my company. Um, so there's, there's hope that exists there. And I, I'd love to be able to hear some of the different stories of kind of what, what are those hope moments? Where, where did you find the, the strength or the support and how did you nurture that into the successes you've had? Well, I'll kick that one off. So um, this is a story I think Josh wants me to tell. But uh, when I first met Josh and found out about I Am the Cavalry, I had a kind of a realization that uh, over the course of my career, most of the stuff that I had done was financial stuff. You know, so it helps make companies at least as profitable or help them not lose as much money. But the first day on my job as an InfoSec person, uh, I was at a hospital. And I walked into um, a situation where they were having the natal intensive care unit fetal heart monitors down, right? So uh, physicians had to spend extra time, nurses had to be around, uh, and there was patient care on the line, as Mike was talking about. Um, and they'd been basically infected with a piece of malicious software that had worked its way around the hospital. Um, so calling the manufacturer, they were unable to do anything because it was a medical device, and so they couldn't modify the medical device to remove the modification from the medical device. And I'll let you wrap your brains around that. But uh, the second thing that I did was went to the executives in the organization and said, look, we need to fix this problem because these devices are broken. Simply replacing them with equivalent devices will get them the new devices broken as well. We have to fix the underlying problem. So with a justification from hospital executives, uh, used Metasploit to pop the box, um, kill the malware, drop the patch, bounce it, and it came back up and the doctors were able to get back to doing doctory things. I don't know, I left them alone after that. But I had a realization that in the last 10 years of my InfoSec career, I'd never had as much impact as I did that first day, right? Which was, was just awful realization to have. <laughs> I've essentially gone down. My, my trajectory has gone like that. Um, so I said, I've got to flip that around. And so today, uh, I regularly have moments where I feel like I'm having wins when I talk to a policymaker, when I talk to somebody else in industry, and you just see that light bulb go on over their head, not because I've beat them over the head with technical stuff, but because I've found a way to social engineer my way into their language and to get them to realize, oh, that's why this matters? Uh, and so I have those moments a lot more often now, and that's what really drives me and gets me passionate. That's awesome. Yeah. What about the rest of you guys? Okay, I'll, uh, <clears throat> uh, like I mentioned in my intro, I'm extremely passionate about securing our ERP systems. And where that's a challenge, if you participate in that yourself, um, the industry average is that about 2% of the issued patches and advisories get addressed because those systems are designed to largely to be untouched, unpatched, you know, un unmodified. You know, of the CIA triad, A is kind of the king when it comes to ERP systems. Um, and you know the, the journey that I went on with my management is, is I said, well, you know, first let's discuss um, what makes ERP special, right? And it's things like, well, it's where by far your most important information is in your company. Okay, that makes it pretty special. It's also supported by incredibly specialized teams because it's incredibly specialized technology. Um, it's also written in languages. So if you take one vendor example, right, SAP, it's written in languages that no one knows or very few people do. In <coughs> SAP's case, it's ABAP, right? Who knows? Show of hands, how many people here know ABAP? One, excellent, that two, that's about right. ABAP is the stop thing, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the polling in here is about right, right, for the industry, so very few people know it. Um, tools, it doesn't integrate with any standard security tools, right? It barely has any static code analysis, really none. It has almost no dynamic of any kind that you can safely do. 
It doesn't send any telemetry to Splunk or ArcSight or any of those tools. It, it's just not designed to work with other security tools. Um, what else makes it special? Organizationally, it tends to be operated by different teams because of how much knowledge you have to have about the business that that ERP supports. Generally, the people who support those systems are also mostly business folks or kind of business plus, right? Business with some IT. So that's what makes ERP special. But what makes them very attractive to attackers? And it's basically the same list, right? It's highly specialized language that no one knows. Most, your most important data is there. It doesn't integrate with any security tools. I mean, it's, it is the, you know, in my opinion, it's the next big area for attackers to look at. And we have some information that suggests that's already starting to happen, right? If you look at two, three years ago when USIS went down, the root cause analysis was it came in through SAP. Um, and, and, and the vendors are starting to get wise to that, right? They're starting... They just randomly open ports to the outside, too. Yeah, well, they're just so, like, oh, we're SAP, whatever. And you're well, like, if you look at... It, so that's a great example. If you just what? look at the it's standard hardening, like, if you just look at the standard care. installation guidelines, they tell you these are the ports we need, except it's not ports, it's ranges. And it's like, okay, right. we need... 33, well, it's a little bit tighter than that, but not much, right? We need 3,300, 33 through 3,400. I don't know, is there anything in that range that might be problematic if every endpoint had open, right? 3389 and some others. So, you know, it's things like that where they're also trying to catch up uh, with security. So in that one particular vendor's example, they've issued 3,600 security patches in the last three years to systems that are designed, that you spent the last 20 years engineering processes around preventing changes in those environments. I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Was there an aha moment where you were like, that's my crusade? Like, that's the, like, I have, I have looked at all these other things, but was there a moment where you were profoundly taken back and said, I, I have to not focus on other things so that I can focus on this? Yes, but it might be a bit boring. And that, that aha moment was when I went to a number of you know, industry conferences, BSIM framework, you know, co conference, all these other places, and I started asking people, do you care about ERP? And I almost never got a yes. And so the reason I felt very passionate about this is because I feel like no one else does. So I actually don't like ERP systems at all. I hate them. <laughs> uh, yes. You know, people tell me, oh, you should just kind of like become the ERP guy and like everyone's got their banner. And I'm like, I really don't want to because I hate these things. I hate them. Like, they're ugly. You know, their interface is atrocious. It's not a sexy technology to be in, but I don't feel like anyone else cares. So that's why I'm doing it. So you it's, love your hate. Yeah, exactly. I love that. So that's my story. I think that's beautiful, though. Thanks. I mean, that's, that's awesome. So quick follow to that before we go next. Um, was there a moment that you felt beyond that where you said this is my crusade and then you took that to the workplace and got the workplace to support your crusade instead of you just waving the banner sitting at a conference by yourself going care about ERP and everybody's like we don't know what that guy is. <laughs> you know, like, yep. Yeah so you know I, I would describe any company's relationship with their ERP vendor regardless who it is as you know, an incredibly bad marriage with an incredibly high cost of divorce. So you just don't do it, right? So you stay tied in with that and with every passing year, your technical debt grows, right? You add 11,000 more customizations. So, you know, what, what helped is when I went to my management and said, look, you know, I'm not gonna mention the word security or vulnerability or risk, but um, how much money are you willing to pay tomorrow for a bad decision from yesterday. So I basically use technical debt as a way to drive awesome. a lot of the security discussion. And, and it actually worked very well. Luckily, I'm in an organization where safety and security are non-discretionary, so we don't have to worry about prioritization and is it above or below the line. So if you, you, know, if you make the right case, there's, there's very good support in our Especially organization. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, thank you. That, sure. Those things are really important to me. Does that resonate with you guys? Like. The, those pieces that where people can get empowered by their passions and then actually turn that into work? Yes. Awesome. Yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we can. Tell me more. Yeah. yeah. I guess I apologize I'll... for interrupting yeah. you apologize. earlier. Yeah. I'm interrupting you now. You meant to do it. I will send you an ERP pony in FedEx. I okay. Have... Sounds good. I have some cards, stickers here. Guys, I got to go. All right. <laughs> Gee. You know, last year she crashed our panel too. You, I love it though. <laughs> I feel like it's just the thing that happens. Audience participation. I'd rather her crash than well, other people, so I'm good. Yeah. That's yeah. when we first met Chris. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> it sure as hell was. I told you to take my seat because I was done. Oh. Which, yeah. I, which you're like seconds away from. 
That's, that's what all of these, uh, the white ones say participant, not attendee. Not just that dude who shows up or gal who shows up, but person who gets involved. That's the spirit of all of this. Yep. So yeah, I just wanted to add on to that, I guess. So me being a transportation researcher working with the federal government, my job is to save lives, basically. There were 35,200 lives lost last year on our nation's roadways. Okay. Right now, there hasn't been, though, uh, as Josh, I think, was saying, any consequences. We don't know of any in the wild you know, cyber attacks that has caused a fatality directly on America's roadways here. Um, what excites me, though, what I want to get at is something Karen actually said, so she's still here, I was glad, um, was, you know, government moves kind of slow. She had a slide up there. And um, what's exciting for me is we're actually starting to change. We actually see that now. Um, you know, we've talked with Josh and had different meetings. We've talked with other people who are in this room, not just working with the, the big three car makers or the car makers, not just working with academics, you know, we're working with small resource organizations. We're listening. We're trying to change because traditionally we are reactive. We have to wait for a problem or the burning river to happen. And we understand that's not going to happen. We do move too slow for that. Matter of fact, a lot of companies move too slow for that. That's why there's patches every week for stuff. So, you know, I do appreciate that, and I do think that's something that's excited me and my team now is that our administration, what we're doing now is actually recognizing that, and we are trying to change, trying to make a difference, and we want to keep that right now with no consequences as much as we can in the future. Did, was, was, there, was there a point where that, for you, kind of got executed into, into work? Like, was there a, a thing that you did to get them to know it, or did it come from a Han high, or was it like... How did that get sticky? So I should give the, the truthful answer or the government answer? Um, I mean, we can turn the camera <laughs> off. I, I'd rather them know so, the truth. That's how the truth is. I'll say the truthful answer. It's pretty effective when you can take a high-level politician, uh, take a policymaker, uh, take your boss into a car that's doing 45 miles an hour down the road, and from your phone push a button and have it steer to the right. <laughs> demos. It's, uh, yeah, demos are very, very effective. Um, it, uh, you know, it is a dog and pony show, yes, but I'll tell you what, you can read about it or you can actually sit in the seat, yeah. be on a, a test track and do this, um, but it really wakes people up. And when you see that potential for this to happen, you know, you start to listen and you start to understand. And, um, you know, these are not easy problems to deal with, but we have to. Awesome. Thank you. One exciting thing uh, on that, you mentioned 35,200 lives lost on the roads. And one of the things that uh, I know that the government is racing towards, as well as the auto industry, is autonomous vehicles. The simple reason being that 94% of those, and these are stats from your boss, That's correct. right? That's uh, 94% of those are from human error. So if you can take the humans out of the loop, you could potentially save tens of thousands of lives and what equates to basically 80 to 100 deaths a day on US roadways. So uh, one of the things, uh, when I was talking to an auto, automaker in Germany, they said, Bo, we're German. We move slow so that we get it right, so that we get the security and safety stuff right. I said, great. While you're moving slowly, there are fatalities on the roadways that could have been prevented if we had maybe abandoned some of the security controls. So I'm not advocating for going the other way, but either side of that spectrum is wrong, right? Because it will cause death. We have to find out what that middle point is and maybe abandon some of the things that we think we should do out of you know, muscle, muscle memory or reflex, like, oh, put antivirus on it, or long passwords, right? Maybe we need to rethink what that is and find a different way that could also then, if we find a way to do it in cars and medical devices, et cetera, maybe we could retrofit some of that to the IT corporate arena and have fewer failures there, too. Um, last one. Passion so. to progress. <laughs> So it, it might sound kind of corny to you, but you know, I've always been you know, a, a Boy Scout. I like fixing things or making something you know, um, happen the, the right way. And I guess my passion or my aha moments are, in order for me, I know that I have the ability to, to fix it and, and make that difference and not just within the organizations that I operate, but even at the larger scale. So that's why you see, and, and those that know I'm out there, you know, I, I, you know, my word is my bond, and that's how you know, I'm, I, I'm able to execute. And I hope that by bringing others that have similar responsibilities 
I help elevate the entire whole. So that's kind of kind of my, and, my hit, man. And so in that, and I'm stupid, so I have to take notes for things. Um, in that, uh, was there a moment there where you got to bring AHA up the food chain and say, I'm, I'm taking this on, <laughs> and, and, and they went from a, no one's doing this to yeah, you're taking it on, we got you? Yeah, when, and again, back on the whole the, the demo piece. Yeah. By bringing in, you know, the dark side, into your, you know, in, yeah. into your offices and tearing down the wall so that people, there is no dark side, they have the same objectives and goals that, that we do. That was sort of some of that aha moment within the organization. And so I needed to bring them in. We needed to demonstrate, you know, directly on, you know, your babies are ugly here. You, we got to clean some of these dogs up. And so, you know, when you do that and you do it in a, in a you know, compelling way in your organization, you know, it means a lot. And, and it's kind of, and not just for us and, and for, you know, for what we do, but, you know, I think I remember um, talking with Billy Rios about, you know, one of his last um, pieces on the pump. And until he actually uploaded and, and, and showed the FDA, the demo of it, that's when they had the, the aha moment and they got it. He could talk about, you know, the compromises and the vulnerabilities and what was discovered and, you know, until he got, you know, blue, but, you know, they weren't going to get it until they could actually, you know, see it and, and smack it in, in front of their face. So keeping it smacked in front of their face is kind of how I try to, <laughs> and I, to keep it I think it there's real. also a second important lesson there, which is he demonstrated it to them not dropped O'Day on stage, right. right? So one of the things that I've observed is if you go in and talk to people in a trustful, clueful way with respect on both sides, then they'll listen to whatever you say. If you instead put them in a position where they're surprised and have to react, they will probably react in a way that is opposite to what you want. Um, so breaking down that wall between people who are both trying to do the right thing and bringing them together is a really, really critical part of doing this. I think that's awesome. So, the again, I'm very simple. So, I, I distill those things in the way that I hear them, right? And to me, it speaks to me. Everybody's story speaks to me in in a different but really congruent way, where we have demonstration being one of those kind of things that helps you break down the walls. Um, but there's also some really poignant other things. I think. Um, you know, when, when you were talking about the ERP plan and being able to bring that to a financial means, that's, that's changing and translating the conversation, right? But the real key of that really wasn't financial. The key to that that I heard, and, and, I, and I can see in some ways, is that you reframed the context of what was going on to their language. You said, if you care about safety, and security, I'm going to put this into the bucket that you care about so that I can be passionate, you can be passionate, and we're on the same goal and on the same path. And I think that that's a huge thing for all of us to learn from. Um, in the beginning, beyond demonstration, what I got was this uh, kind of pride of ownership, right? My word's my bond, that's what I do, I say I'm gonna do it, and I think that that's another really, really powerful thing for all of us to to start looking at and learning from to say, if you're going to do something and you do it with integrity, that integrity is going to gain you the type of political capital and the type of flexibility that may not be present. It may, you may have to work 10 years to get your integrity to the level of that where it's every single time they say they're gonna do it, they do it. And, and then you'll have, you'll have those pieces. And, and the demonstration piece is beautiful because demonstration is actually really hard. Demonstration is so hard because you're trying to figure out how hard do I hit somebody with the Nerf bat to like annoy them enough to know that they could have got hit with a steel bat, but not hard enough that they're mad at you for hitting them with a Nerf bat. And that's a real kind of <laughs> delicate line to play. And so being able to do that and execute on those things, I think takes the integrity. I think it takes the pride of ownership. I think it takes where, where with you, I see this impact. It takes, 
I am driven by the amount of impact that happens. And the more impact that happens, the more fueled I get about it, the more passion I put into it, the more impact happens after that. And it's this fireball that goes down using each one of these things that you guys kind of have some distinct views on together to break down all of the walls and to change what you love doing into what you're doing. And if I can just add to your comment, I think one part that you mentioned I want to emphasize even more, which is, you know, this may not be <laughs> maybe the most popular thing to say, but if you want to influence your organization, you have to start speaking their language, right? Uh, Hallelujah. You, you can't do a backflip every time you find cross-site scripting. I'm sorry, in the grand scheme of things, it just doesn't <laughs> matter. It really doesn't. It's, it, you know, whether to fix that or not is just another business decision. Just like whether it's to upgrade a valve fitting or whatever, you know, build a new campus. It's just another business decision. And um, I think we will have far more respect, you know, in our boardroom and with our senior management um, when we can speak more their language, which is around, you know, business prioritization, forex adjustments, you know, depreciation, resource capital around the world. I mean, th that's how these decisions are made. And we can't continue to be kind of odd stepchildren in that discussion, right? We need to start being active participants in the business discussion. Yep. Um, lastly, of my interest, because I'm selfish and I get to moderate so I can ask you questions. Uh, how do you survive the fatigue? Because you guys are making profound changes in macro industries that have never been able to make these kinds of changes. You're breaking down huge walls that people aren't even willing to scale. And breaking bricks is tiring. Like, what do you do to stay in the game? I used to say drink. I don't say that. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether it's because I'm getting old or whether That's my fatigue uh, outlasts my ability to drink, um, but I, now for myself, I'm I'm an introvert, so I just like go into a quiet room and sit and maybe listen to some music and spend my weekends like not leaving the house, which is maybe not the healthiest thing. But if you've been in D.C. lately, it's like the temperature here, but with also 100% humidity, so <laughs> it's not really fun to go outside. Uh, but but I know other people deal with it in different ways, um, and I think the the uh, condensed answer would be, whatever recharges you, go do that. What about the rest of you guys? Because I imagine y'all have like secret tips that I need to learn from because I get tired quick. <laughs> oh, so for me, I mean, it's not fatigue yet. Um, I mean, automotive cybersecurity is kind of an emerging field. You're starting to see companies now have you know, cyber directors report to CEOs. You're starting to see companies making changes in their designs. You're starting to have companies come to at least us, the government, and say, look, we realize this is a problem, and here's what we're doing about it, and we want to tell you because we want you to get smart too. Um, you know, so right now, That's it's awesome. not fatiguing. I mean, it's really an emerging area right now. Um, you know, uh, back to Karen, government, slow, move, slow, you know, no change. But, you know, this area right now, because of automation, because of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, because of higher-end audio systems in the cars, you know, this is all the new frontier. Ten years ago, let's go hack the car. Okay, that meant cut a brake line, pull the throttle cable, uh, maybe sever, you know, a steel belt on the tire, and 100 miles later, ha, 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 you know. Now we have the, the cars are equipped with, I'll say, the tools to allow them to be compromised or to allow them to be vulnerable. You know, you can't take a 57 Chevy and steer it to the left, at least from a computer. <laughs> um, you know, so for, for me at least, um, and at least my team, we're not fatigued. This is a new emerging area. We've set up a new division. Um, I have a new lab, um, and it's very exciting for us. So um, that's, you know, that's we haven't awesome. hit that point. You uh, know what? Good. I mean, in that, and what an opportunity for people who feel it to look at your industry and go, I need, I need to go somewhere where the fuel is. There's also probably a lot of people in this room who can help fatigue you if you want that. <laughs> <laughs> we can get you there. Don't worry. Is this the whole, like, lead a horse to water, can't make him drink, we'll can make him really tired? And to Bo's point, I would drink, and yeah, I own a brewery, too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Some preparing. No. Drinking might come back into your story now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, for me, uh, you know, when you asked the question, I had kind of a little bit of a crisis. I'm like, wow, I've never thought about that. But the honest answer is I, I would agree with you. Um, it's not even close. I'm not like I barely I've barely gotten started. I, I have so much left in the tank, let's say, where 
Uh, no one's even put a dent yet to slow me down. I feel like I still have a tremendous runway of passion to carry me through all this. I, I don't feel the slightest bit of fatigue. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, I don't feel it at all. I mean, and I, well, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to build a world-class software security program. And, you know, we just got, we've just gotten started. Not even close yet. Love it. So I would describe kind of your fatigue from, a, you know, I've hit that wall. And because you, you, you constantly, as you said, trying to knock the, the bricks down and you hit a few of them and it's like, okay, this isn't getting me any, any, anywhere. And so um, I, I, I also don't know if I call it fatigue or more, how am I going to approach that wall in a different way? Sure. And, and that for me is, you know, I try to, to, to go back into the, the, the toolkit and understand you probably faced this in some other fashion and another different means. What did you do? What did you leverage from there? Who can you seek out? So I get re-energized by, you know, 